Amen. So today, we are starting the Samuel series. Last week, we had an overview. I just want to ask you all, if you all did not listen to last week's message, please listen to Pastor Chu's message. It was wonderful, a wonderful overview of 1 and 2 Samuel. And I want to implore you to listen to Pastor Isaac's message as well. It's one of the best one of the best exposition of Psalms 22 that I have ever heard. And, and I mean, we are pastors, right? So we listen to a lot of sermons, we hear a lot of things. Seriously, it's one of the best. If you did not catch that, please go catch it. Go and watch it. It will impact your life. All right, today I'm going to go through 1 Samuel chapter 16 and 17. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 16 talks about Samuel anointing David to be king. When David was still a little kid, a little boy. Chapter 17 talks about David going against Goliath. You know, I've entitled my sermon of sheep, sling and stones, which talks about the different phases that David went through in these chapters. Why sheep? You might be asking. Why not? It's David. David was a shepherd boy, right? Sheep. Sheep talks about the time where he was a shepherd and he was in the fields, not known by anybody, not seen by anybody. So what I, what I call this is the sheep season. Sheep season, all right? It is a time marked by hiddenness. That is when God was preparing him and molding him and making sure he's ready to go against Goliath and not just Goliath, all the other enemies. He was sending him bears and lions to be able to fight so that he can be prepared. Then we talk about the sling, the sling season, all right? This, I, t- I, I put the sling, but really is about the divine catapulting of David into his destiny. You see, David, when he went, he, when he went into Israel, when he went into to the valley of uh, Elah, right? The valley of Elah. He did not know that Goliath was there. He did not know that there was a war. He was there just to follow what his father told him to do. Bring some food to your brothers. See, he did not know, but then out of, out of a sudden, there was a divine catapulting of David into his destiny. Yes, he was not a king just yet, but that was the first step into his destiny. Then we talk about the stones. The stones talk about God's undeniable power that helps us in taking down Goliath. The stone went and hit Goliath but it's just a mere stone, a small stone. If you've been to the, to, to the valley of Elah, you will see there are, there are quite a lot of stones there, okay? I thought about taking one stone and putting it into a case and mark, this could have been the stone that David used. It's a very good souvenir, right? Yeah, but I didn't do that. Lah. Anyway, but you see, the stone is so it's, it's an insignificant thing. How could a stone bring down a nine-feet man, man of a giant? How could it? So that is God's undeniable power. You know, I believe some of us in this season, we are going through the tauntings of Goliath in our lives. It could be some financial crisis, some health scare, some career crisis, or even a spiritual battle. And as we look at the life of David, we would be able to gain some insights to defeat these Goliaths that we are facing. But before we dive into 1 Samuel 16 and 17, let us look into Isaiah 55 because Isaiah spoke about David here. Come all of you who are thirsty, come to the waters. This, are, this is a very, very common verse. Everybody always quote this verse, right? And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen. Listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the riches of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may leave. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. See, when you do all that, He will make an everlasting covenant with you. And it is a love promise to David. And then God goes, See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Here it says that David is a witness, 
a witness. He is like sort of a prototype, a design, a design of how when God awakens you into your destiny, He will take you into the necessary process to prepare you for your destiny. So whoever He calls, He equips. But sometimes the way He equips is not the way we, th we think He would equip us. All right? So we get to look at his life of how he walked in the process and, and how he prepared in the process and how he carried his heart through it. Seriously, listen to Psalms 22 by Pastor Isaac. It really shared about how he carried his heart through every single situation. Now what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to set the stage, all right? Because I'm studying in 1 Samuel 16. There is a whole lot of stuff that happened. There's a whole lot of stuff that happened before 1 Samuel 16. See, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, Israel wanted to be like other nations. They wanted a king. Now, God's design was that God Himself was the king. But Israel wanted to be like other nations and to have their own king. So God tells Samuel, Samuel, all right, go get them a king. And that's how we got King Saul, all right? Here the Bible describes a good-looking man. 1 Samuel chapter 9, very good looking. They say, there is not a more handsome person among the children of Israel. What a title, man. What a title. Not a more handsome person among the children of Israel. Wow. Wow. Okay. If you all don't wow, I'm wowing, right? It's like, wow. You see him, oh, so handsome. Okay. He's tall, right? The Bible says he's one head taller than all other people. He's tall. He's really tall. So when you look at him, whoa, tall, handsome, not dark. But then the, back then the people were a bit darker skin, right? So tall, dark, and handsome. My gosh. Dang. Wow. But you see, King Samuel, uh, King Saul, Saul, he struggled with a couple of things. He struggled with insecurities. He struggled with the fear of men, always wanting to please people. He struggles with political pressures. And one more thing. He is not God conscious. You see, from Samuel being anointed as king in chapter 10, all the way to chapter 16, when David was anointed, Saul failed miserably in two accounts. Number one, in chapter 13, he did not wait for Samuel to come to offer the sacrifice, to perform the sacrifice. And what did he do? He did it himself. And what was God's response to this? 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. But now your kingdom shall not continue. Wow, that's harsh. One mistake. Now your kingdom shall not continue. And then the, in, it goes on. The Lord has sought for Himself a man after His own heart. You see, this, this word, the Lord has sought himself, for him, himself a man after His own heart. This was even before David was introduced in the Scripture. All right? And the Lord has commanded him to be the commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. That the second incident, the second account which he failed was 1 Samuel chapter 15. He did not obey Samuel's word to get rid of all the Amalekites. And what was the response to this? In 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 27, and as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. You see, he failed on two accounts. Why? All because of the fear of men, wanting to please people and the people around him, wanting to please the other nations. And God's response to Israel in these two incidents was basically... Israel, you got your definition of a king and he has failed. Now, let me give you a definition of a king. And that's where we are. 1 Samuel 16. I hope that set the stage for you. This is where we are, all right? So God says, Samuel, go to the house of Jesse because I have provided a king for myself in Bethlehem. See, Samuel shows up, then shows up in the house of Jesse and says, tells Jesse, line up your boys. Line up your boys. And Jesse does as what he's told. He lines them up and from the Bible, we can know that they are tall and they are handsome. Wow. 
Yeah, now you know what are the things that get me, right? Tall, handsome. Whoa. You've got Eliab, you've got Abinadab, Shama, Nathaniel, Radi, Ozem. You've got all the brothers that's fit. A man's idea of success and prosperity. What people would look for as a king. Just like how Saul was. You see, it was man's definition of a king all over again. And then the Lord rebukes Samuel. Why? Because Samuel, when he went to one, one, one of the sons, said, surely this must be it. God said, no. Surely this must be it. No. God said, no. Surely. And then God rebukes Samuel. He says, Samuel, I've got to correct your vision right now. What you are seeing is the way men see things. You know, I've got to correct your perspective. You think it's about the best looking, the most gifted, the most qualified, the one with the most certs? No. I want you to get delivered from the outward appearances. And I want you to know that I am looking at hearts. Samuel then questions Jesse. Do you have any more sons? Jesse went, yes I do. The youngest one is out there tending sheep. Samuel then says, Send him and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes. And when David arrives in the presence of all his other brothers, Samuel takes the oil of anointing and pours it on David. Back then, it's pouring, it's all, it's, it's gone. If it pours over, we all just stick and do a small little cross, right? Okay, if we do that, yeah, you go back very dirty lah. Okay, so, but back then, that's what it is. It is to really show that he is anointed from the top of his head, from the tip of his head to the tip of his toe, all the way. And he did it in front of his brothers. Wow. Anointing him as God's chosen king, this would certainly create some trouble. It will create difficulty in David's life, as we will see later. Some jealousy, a lot of envy, some turmoil in David's life. And this is where it gets interesting. Now, you can turn to me to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. It's on the screen. I'm going to read it out because I've got a lot of verses to, to go through. So, keep up with me. All right. 13, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And the distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player of the harp. And it shall be that he will play it with his hand when the distressing spirit from God is upon you and you shall be well. Out of the blue, out of a sudden, out of a sudden when, when over here Samuel anoints David, bam, the spirit of the Lord comes upon him. Then over here King Saul's, bam, the spirit of the Lord lives from him and a distressed, distressing spirit comes upon him. Then the servant over here, Master, I have an idea. And that idea is, let's get you someone that plays the harp really well. Let's get you a skillful harp player. And then when he plays the harp, the distressing spirit will leave. And Saul agrees. That's a pretty good idea. Let's do that. Let's do that. Here, you see, it gives insight into what David was doing in the sheep season. The hidden years. So I call this the sheep season of his life. Now I'm going to dwell here for quite a bit in this sheep season. The sheep season in David's life is a season of hiddenness. A time where nobody could really see David. A time when he was insignificant. Before David was anointed, and even after David was anointed by Samuel, David was tending to his father's sheep. He got anointed and he went back to tend to his father's sheep. But in this time of hiddenness, he wasn't just tending sheep. He was spending time with the Lord. He was writing the Psalms. He was writing and worshipping God. He was cultivating a culture of intimacy with God. And more than that, he was cultivating a gift. He was cultivating his worship a skillful harp player. He was playing and practicing on the harp and becoming excellent 
with his gifting, not knowing that it would be the gifting that would open a door into the next season of his life. Follow me now, 1 Samuel 16 verse 17. So Saul said to his servant, provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. The one, then one of the servants answered and said, look, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech and a handsome person. Wow. And the Lord is with him. Therefore, Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread and of a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by his son David to Saul. So David came to Saul and stood before him and he loved him greatly and he became his armor bearer. Then Saul sent to Jesse saying, please let David stand before me for he has found favor in my sight. And so it was whenever the spirit from God was upon Saul that David would take a harp and play it with his hand. Then Saul would become refreshed and well and the distressing spirit would depart from him. You see, verse 18 tells us what David was doing in his sheep season, in the hiddenness. He was playing his harp. He was cultivating a gift. And not just that, he was playing it skillfully. Because in this hiddenness, he was cultivating and growing this gift, which he used it to offer worship to God. See, in verse 18, it also said that the servant said, the Lord is with him. How did others know that the Lord is with him? That means when, whenever people would pass by their farm, their orchard, their place in Bethlehem, people would probably see David worshipping God, playing on his harp, singing songs to him, praying to God. And then they would hear or they would feel that the Lord is upon him. And the word was spread, spread, spread to the servants. That's how the servant would knew so in the hiddenness, when nobody was watching, David was cultivating a gift. He was growing a gift and then offering the gift back to God. You see, he wasn't waiting for a door to open before starting to grow the gift. A lot of us here, we, we wait. Oh, I'm going to wait for this ministry to open up. I'm going to join and then I'm going to start cultivating a gift. No, that's not what David did. David said, I'm not going to wait for any ministry to open up. No, I'm going to cultivate my gifts right now in the hiddenness with the sheep. The sheep will sing with me. Bear, will sing with me. Yes, I'm going to sing together with the sheep. Because you know why there's a famous saying that says, the shepherd smells like sheep. God was doing that. He was teaching him, preparing him. So in that time, he was worshipping, cultivating his gift before any door open. And without an expectation of doors to open. See, in the hiddenness, he was already learning to minister to God. Not knowing that one day, this particular gift, playing the harp skillfully, would open a door into his next season. See, there are many here right now who are in the sheep season. Many of us here, many of us here, you are hidden right now. You might not be serving in any ministry right now. You might not have a platform or a public ministry right now, but God is cultivating the gift right now within you. He's growing that gift that one day this gift will open a door to your next season. One day this gift will open up and hey, bam, Servolution Weekend. <laughs> oh, you saw where, where, where am I getting to? This weekend is the last Servolution Weekend. Do sign up so that your gifts can be good. Your gifts can be used by the Lord. So do sign up. Worship is recruiting. Media is recruiting. And Connect is recruiting. You've got gifts. It's time to get out of the hiddenness. Amen? Amen. And especially now that we are talking about David. See, God is cultivating and growing musicians. I believe in this time of age, the age that we're living in, the end days, God is raising musicians and singers in this day of age because He wants to restore the tabernacle of David, which is actually a reflection of what's happening in Revelation 4 and 5, 
which is actually throne room worship. You see, what we saw in Revelation 4 and 5 is that there was a throne of God and around the throne of God were four living creatures bowing and worshipping. And after that, there were the 24 elders worshipping. And what David did when he took the Ark of the Covenant back, he placed it in a tent and he instituted musicians and singers giving worship 24-7, just like Revelation 4 and 5. And this is what God wants to do right now in this age, in this era that, that we're living in. He's raising prophetic worshippers that will minister to Him in the secret first, in the hiddenness first. Then when they enter into service, either in a worship team or in prayer altars or in cell group, we're going to see people get set free. We're going to see breakthroughs and we're going to see freedom. Why? Because they would know the intimacy of God. They would know how to host His presence. They would be ready to host His presence anywhere, anytime. And the distressing spirit that's upon people will be lifted. As I was preparing this message, I got a word. And this word is for the worship team. I'm the worship pastor. And so it's like kind of for me as well. All right. There is going to be an anointing of musicians and singers who will learn their craft and give it back to God as an offering. And ministering to Him with your craft in the hiddenness. God is going to use you the worship teams in SRBKL. He's going to use you to set atmospheres of expectation that will break the powers of fear and anxiety that is plaguing a generation. He's going to use you. There will be a breakthrough in mental health issues and mental disorders in these atmospheres, just like how Saul was able to get a breakthrough. And I felt God just telling me this, to release this to the worship teams in SIBKL. So, harness your gifts, hone it well, cultivate it, offer it back to God. Offer it back to God. See, Scripture tells us that David was tending to sheep. Then Samuel anoints David at the age of 15 or 16 and David goes back into the field tending to the sheep. Then out of a sudden, he has an open door. And he was summoned by the king to minister to God before the king. So now David tends to ship during the weekdays. And in the weekends, he's got a little side gig in the palace. Hey, sounds familiar? We work during the weekdays and we come to serve in the weekends, right? David was doing that. He was doing that. And all of this was part of his hiddenness. I love that David went back to tending sheep. You know, there are two times that David could have gone, I'm done with sheep. Sheep, yeah, no more. But he did not. The first time was when he was anointed. Samuel anointed him king. He could have gone, yeah, I'm king. I don't need no sheep. I'm, oh, I just can't wait to be king, right? He could have done a Simba. No, but he did not. He went back to tending to sheep. Second incident when King Saul summoned him to play in the palace, he could have said, whoa, I've made it. I've made it into the palace. I've made it big. You know, for everybody else are just soldiers and farmers. Come on, man. I'm a musician in the king's palace, yo. But no, he did not. He went back to tending to sheep. So there's something to be learned here about David. When you are called or when you are anointed, you do not abandon your hidden place. Do not abandon your hidden place. Always go back to that hidden place where you cultivate a relationship with God. Always go back. See, David did not let his hidden place go. And I believe he wanted to go back to tending to the sheep because this was the place of intimacy with God. A place where he fellowships with God and finds everything he needs in God. You see, for many of us, when we are anointed or when we are called, we turn our anointing or we turn our calling into an idol. I'm called to be a pastor. Whoa, then I'm a pastor. Wow, I'm become a pastor. You know, oh, I'm called to be a prophet. Wow, prophet, prophet, prophet. See, there's something about David. 
he had that revelation where he could trust God to carry him into the fullness of his destiny. David went back into the hiddenness. Called or not called, it doesn't matter. Because David knew that in the hidden place, he's already rewarded. He's got what he needs. David got a revelation that God was his reward. He don't need no calling. He don't need no anointing. He just need God. And it's so evident in Psalms 27, verse 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord. See, He desires of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. He comes to that hidden place, the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord. That's what he was doing in the hidden place, beholding the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. See, the reward in that hidden place was beholding the beauty of God every day, desiring him and God looking down upon him, shining his face down upon him. That's the best reward any of us could get. Calling or not, anointing or not. Many of us, when we are anointed or when we are called, we want to enter into the destiny now, instantly, right? You know, not understanding that there is a time of preparation and a process before we enter into that destiny. So before we enter into the destiny, we need to go into the hiddenness, the mundaneness. Nothing sexy about it, you know? Not Instagram-worthy kind of stuff, the boring, boring stuff that nobody sees. See, why does God not fulfill a calling straight away when He awakens it in someone? See, He didn't make King David, He didn't make David king right away after anointing him. No, He gave Joseph a dream, you know? He gave Joseph a dream where all his brothers are bowing down to him and that he's going to be awesome and mighty and then takes him through 20 years of hell to get to that dream, right? The pit, Potipa's house, dungeon, accused of rape, forgotten. 20 years. Why does Moses suddenly get a burden for the Israelites at the age of 40 and then goes another 40 more years into the wilderness before God can use him? And we know Jesus, right? Jesus at the age of 12. Jesus already knew at the age of 12, the Bible says he was about his father's business. But then he disappears. He goes into the hiddenness. And we do not meet Jesus until he's at the age of 30. See, there's a period of hiddenness that we would need to go through. And in this hiddenness, God shapes and forms us. And the devil knows this. That's why he's instigating, he's encouraging a culture of instant gratification. And in this modern day that we live in, it does not help either. Everything is fast and instant. Everything is fast, fast, chop, chop. So a lot of us, we don't have the paradigm for hiddenness. We don't have the patience to be in the hiddenness. Many of us are not able to value the process of God taking us into the school of hiddenness and mundaneness. Not understanding that things He is working in the hiddenness is setting us up for destiny when we walk into it. I gotta go faster. Who here has seen the karate kid? I'm talking about the, the old karate kid, the old, old one. Not the, not the new one with Jaden Smith and Jackie Chan. Although, yeah, I salute Jackie Chan, but yeah, no, not that movie, no. Uh, not the Cobra, Cobra Kai in Netflix. Pretty good. It's an ongoing of the karate kid. But no, this one, that wasn't when Daniel San already. So the original karate kid, right, is about Mr. Miyagi and Daniel San, right? Daniel San moves over to California. He gets bullied, he gets, he gets beaten up. So Daniel San now wants to defend himself. He wants to learn karate. And then he goes to Mr. Miyagi. And Mr. Miyagi goes, Okay, I will teach you karate. Okay. You must listen to what I do. Okay. I can't, I can't imitate him. Yeah. But he says, what, what does he ask Daniel San to do? Pin the fence. Up, down, up, down. Then what do you ask him to do? Wash the car. Wax on, wax off. Then there was one more. Stain the deck. Oh, stain the deck. Oh, stain the deck. And Daniel San does all of this, 
And after a while, he gets super angry and super mad and he confronts Mr. Miyagi saying, what are you doing? You're just asking me to do all your house chores and do all your house nicely, right? And Mr. Miyagi goes, Dennis, son, pin the fence. Who? Play who? Then what happens? Dennis son opens his eyes and then Mr. Miyagi keeps on going. Now, wax on. Who? Wow. Wax off. Gives a kick. What's that? Stay in the deck. Wow. Guess what? He was doing karate. Karate. By the way, I'm karate as well. <laughs> yeah, but I, I failed in a lot of things. Lah. They, they whacked me up really bad. My glasses broke three times. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, what Dennison did not know that in the mundaneness, in the boring stuff that he was doing, he was actually learning karate. Karate. Daniel Sun did not see the connection of the preparation to the destiny. God is doing that with all of us. He's saying to some of you, you're going to be a pastor. You're going to be a prophet. Now, go be a waiter. Go serve and bless. You're going to influence the nations and impact generations. Now, go do some accounting. Go do some admin work. You're going to operate in the gift of healing and many blind eyes and deaf ears will be opened when you pray for them. Go and drive a grab car. And we listen. Some of us, we listen and we do. We will go. But there will come a point where we will say, God, this is crazy. This is crazy. I don't see it. I don't see the connect. I'm supposed to be a prophet of some kind, but here I am driving a grab car. What is this? No, but God will say, keep doing it. Mr. Miyagi, daniel son, pin the fence. Keep doing. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep doing it. You know why? Because when we keep doing it, and when we don't see that connection, but we know it is of God, we start to give up our own desires. We start to give up our own ambition, our own will. We start to give up our own idolization of our calling. And then we begin to say, keep doing, God will say, keep doing, and you'll say, yes. I will give up my will, and I will trust you. And every time you do that, something shifts. Every time you say, I give you, I surrender, something shifts. And then five to ten years later, you're not in a place where you don't, you're in a place now that you don't have to engineer for things to happen. You don't have to rub shoulders, get the right connection. You don't have to go to special conferences. You don't have to go and meet people when they come and you know, show some f- fancy a bit, you know. So that they will then, you will connect to them and they elevate your status. No. God will open the door for you in that mundaneness of things. You move from a place of trying to make something happen to a place where I surrender. Calling or not, God you are my reward. And whatever you have for me, no man can stop it. You see, my heart's desire is to see a whole generation getting this. This is what separates David from everybody else. When it's anointing time for David, what does David do? I surrender. When you have an audience with the king, David goes, Lord, I surrender. When he gets a promotion, it's promotion time. I surrender. The promotion is not my reward. You are my reward. When he is being chased by a demonized father-in-law, same thing. Lord, I surrender. When he's being faced by the betrayal of a son, Lord, I surrender. My heart's desire is for a generation that longs for the hiddenness, where we would surrender to him daily and die to ourselves daily, that we will start to see that he is our reward, that he is all that we need, calling or not, anointing or not. And in this hiddenness, he'll begin to forge our giftings. And he'll begin to build intimacy with us. See, the things 
that you find boring will set the stage for an open door to your destiny one day. Wow, I'm really out of time. I'm going to just breeze through this right now. The sling season. The sling season is when there is a divine catapulting into your destiny. Where God is going to open divine doors for you in the middle of the mundaneness. You see, when David met Goliath, he wasn't looking to pick a fight. No. He wasn't looking to, to jump into any battle. No. What he was doing, what he, he was just listening to his father. He was being obedient to the father's orders. It's just another mundane day. It's just another boring day doing more chores. Serving his father, serving his brothers, and some of the brothers do not like him, as you will see. I think I, I, I won't be reading the verses anymore, but you know the story. You know the story. David goes, he takes food for his brothers. He goes to the, to the valley of Elah. And then over there, out of the sudden, a Philistine came forward every morning and every evening and he took his stand. This dude walked down in the morning and started defying the armies of Israel. He started taunting the Israelites, trash-talking the Israelites, trash-talking the God of Israel, challenging them to send someone to fight. What was he doing? He was working fear into the Israelite camp. And some of you are in that season right now where fear is creeping into your hearts. You are being taunted by a Goliath in this season. And he is saying, you're useless. You'll amount to nothing. Hey, you've got cancer. You've got a daily disease. You're not, you're not going to live. You're going to die. You're in a financial crisis. You're going to be broke. And you know what? Your family will start to leave you. Your kids will leave you. You know, just a couple of months ago, there was a man that called up church office. You know, he was in, a, he was in debt, really, really in debt. He lost his job and he called up because he was about to end his life. He called up and, and I was the only pastor in the office back then at that time. So I took it up. I talked to him. I prayed with him. I told him to look to God. And for the next few days, on a daily basis, we talked and I connected him with someone to be able to help him manage his debt. He started coming to church. You see, he found his hidden place. He connected back to God. He found his hidden place. He came to church. He got our pastors to pray for him. He got our elders to pray for him. And right now, he's not fully out of debt just yet, but he's in church. He's got a stable, good job and he's starting to pay off his debts right now. He's beginning to see that Goliath, that Goliath would not stand. He's beginning to get a revelation of God right now. And this is what we need, that revelation that David had. You see, David had no idea that his destiny was going to change that afternoon. He had no idea that his Instagram account it's going to jump up to 1 million subscribers. And the whole, all he was doing was just obeying that. Nothing more to it. No fresh anointing that day. No sense that, wow, today is the day. No. None. None whatsoever. But it was God's appointed timing when He came. And that Philistine came out and taunted Him. You see, the sling season is God's sovereign timing. What was just another day of mundane tasks turned into the perfect moment when David visits his brothers on the battlefield and out came that giant. See, God's timing. It's all about God's timing. You see, when the Israelites saw the man, they saw, it was the eyes that saw, and they retreated because of fear, David started advancing because of faith. More than seeing, he heard what, the, what Goliath was saying. He heard Goliath taunting the Israelites. See, David was walking in a realm of faith and not by sight. See, when the Israelites heard Goliath, they were filled with fear. When David heard Goliath, he was filled with faith. Something awoken within him. And this is where it gets interesting. 
This is where it gets interesting. David goes up and say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Everybody say, uncircumcised. <laughs> I just make it awkward. <laughs> Why did David say that? So weird. So weird, right? It's so weird. You know why? Because David got a revelation. A revelation that all can only come in the hiddenness. And that revelation is that he is uncircumcised. What does that mean? He is not in covenant with God. We are in covenant with God. Who is he to taunt the God of Israel? Who is he to taunt the people of Israel? We are the covenant people. God has made a covenant with Abraham and circumcision is the outward sign of that covenant. And he knew, he knew. And this can, could only come in that hiddenness. So David draws that revelation. You see, our friend that I told you about, the one that was about to take his life, he started to see this. He got this revelation that he is of God's. And when he is of God, God is on his side. No Goliath can take him down. And he is on his way right now. He is on his way right now to success, to getting free. See, David's faith is beginning to awaken and build up. But then, you see, the older brother started to come. And the older brother started to say to him, you know, what did he say? Why have you come down here? See, he burned with anger. And why do you come, come down here? And with whom did you leave those sheep with in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Know that in your journey of preparation, in the sheep season, know that in the sling season, there will be people, even the closest of friends and family, that will voice accusations and speak against your destiny. David felt this. He also felt this in Psalm 69. He says, I'm a stranger in my father's house. Psalms 27, David said, when my mother and father forsake me. David knew this. He felt this. There will be people that's closest to you that will ridicule the dream and destiny God has placed on the inside of you. All right. You see, when David said that, King Saul heard of it. It got to King Saul's ears. King Saul said, David, come here. David had an audience with the king. And David, King Saul asked him, are you sure you can do this? David said, your servant has went up against bears and lions. It's not going to be anything different right now. See, when, da when, king da when David said this, I want to I mention two things here. I want to mention two things. One, in the hiddenness, there will be breakthroughs with bears and lions. All right? There will be mini breakthroughs that God will give you so that you can build your confidence to bigger battles. Number two, God knew. David knew his anointing. When David was saying, your servant has killed bears and lions, you know killing bears and lions is not natural. It's crazy, right? It's not natural. Oh, a lion, oh my gosh. And not just that, he strike a lion and he pull a sheep out of the lion's mouth. What was David saying? Your servant, when he kills bears and lions, he's under the anointing of God. David knew his anointing and he came in that hiddenness. He came in that hidden place. Oh. You know what was David trying to say? I've got the strength and power when the anointing comes to me. And I've felt it before, and I've done it before, and I feel it now. You see, when God has anointed you and called you, you will know, and you will walk in it. Then King, King Saul went, okay, all right, let me give you an armor, let me give you a sword, because that's the way we fight. I will give you my armor and my sword. But David said, no. I can't walk in this. He tried it on like, oh, I can't walk in this. Probably too tall, too handsome. Saul was too tall, too handsome. Like, oh, the glory. <laughs> no. You see, when God calls you and anoints you, 
you need to walk in your own anointing and your own calling. You can't walk in another person's anointing. Don't try to be someone else. Be who God is calling you to be. Can I get the musicians up right now? I'm going to close soon. I'm going to share a little, a little of my testimony right now. You know, around the age of 14, 15, uh, I was saved at the age of 12. I grew up in a family, Christian family, but only saved at the age of 12. At the age of 14, 15, there was a pastor with, with a gift of prophecy that came. And this pastor, she prophesied over me and said that you, I'm going to be operating in the gift of healing and deliverance. I didn't think too much about it, but hey, that's a cool word. It's a very cool word. So I took it home. I prayed about it. I asked God. I tried to exercise it. I prayed for people. Nobody got healed, unfortunately. Oh well, I continue on. I continue on. There was the age of 14, 15, about David, David's age. At the age of 23, much later, I was worship leading in, in church. And I was, when I was worship leading, I suddenly felt the anointing of the Lord come upon me. It was so clear. It was so tangible. I felt God saying that there were three people that needed healing. One with a headache, a migraine, one with a back pain, and one with an ankle pain. Well, I prayed for people. Nobody got healed. I've done it. I faced rejection. So, let's go at it again. I released that word and I prayed. But it was in a church setting. I was worship leading. I wasn't praying for anybody directly. So I didn't know whether people got healed or not. Right after service, one person came. Hey, Aaron, when you prayed, my migraine left. It's like, wow, okay. That's probably a coincidence. I'm an accountant, okay? I used to be an accountant, so yeah, you have to be like 99.99%. Worse still, I'm an auditor last time, all right? So we audit every single thing. <laughs> then after that, midday, midday, after a prayer meeting, somebody else came up and said, hey, Aaron, when you prayed that day, my back pain disappeared. It's like, whoa, okay. 66% right now. It's so still a coincidence. Maybe. Maybe. Now I'm in the maybe, maybe stage. Then one week later, one week later, my best friend's sister comes up to me. So I know this is real, real, real. My best friend's sister came up to me and said, Aaron, I've got a sprained ankle for three months. It's been pain. So painful. Every single time I walk. But in this week, the pain started going off bit by bit, bit by bit, bit by bit, by bit. And this weekend, there was no more pain. I forgot about it. I could walk normally. And when I saw you, I remembered, I used to have a pain, but now it's gone. It's 100%. Like, wow. I felt, if I were to relate to David's story, I felt that that was as if it was the summoning of the king to activate in this gift of healing, to start moving in this gift of healing. That's what I did. Started praying for people, going about. Still saw a lot of failures. Still saw a lot of rejection. Still saw, saw a lot of nobody getting healed. But then only in the age of 28, 29, we went out to the streets. We did some street E, street evangelism. And over there, I saw crazy things that happened. Of course, at first it was scary. Those were my bears and my lions. I can tell you my bear. What was my bear? My bear was when a man walked up with a broken arm. He was a migrant. So he could not go to see a doctor because if he were to go to see a doctor, he would be caught and he would be sent back to his country. But he had a broken arm and it was swelling. And I went, oh my goodness. God, you better show up. But I saw when I prayed, when we as a team, we prayed for him, the swelling went down bit by bit, bit by bit. That was my bear. I'm glad that I conquered it. Then I, 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 then I had a lion that came. What was that lion? The lion was a man with crutches. This man had one feet shorter than the other feet. He's Ang Mo, right? I was assigned to the train station. When you were assigned to the train station, you say, oh, cannot already one. Everybody is always rushing to go somewhere or rushing to yeah, go somewhere. Go Get on a train or get out of the train, go somewhere. I was like, ah, oh, I cannot. But when I saw the man with crutches, I felt what David felt. You see, when people saw crutches, when people, normal people, they see crutches and they want to pray, they might feel fear. But suddenly within me, faith arose because I had slayed 
a bear. Now came a lion, right? So I went to him and I said, Sir, can I pray for you? We've been praying for people. We've been seeing some measure of healing. Would you like to be prayed for? He said, yes, sure, why not? We set him down. We measured. It was one inch shorter. One feet was one inch shorter than the other. We begin to pray. We say the first prayer, op- close our eyes, say the first prayer, open our eyes. Look at, the, look at the feet. Still the same. Still the same. But I asked him, Sir, do you feel anything? He said, I felt a tingling sensation. All right, we're on to something right now. I said, Sir, I'm going to pray for you some more. Then we, we, I closed my eyes and I prayed again, Lord, grow his leg. I opened my eyes and we measured. It was now half an inch shorter. And then your mind plays tricks on you, right? Like maybe it was already half an inch shorter. Maybe you measured wrongly. Maybe he said wrongly that his leg go back up. You know, you see sometimes like that. So this time I said, I'm going to open my eyes. I'm going to open my eyes and I'll open my eyes. And I did. And all I said was, God, grow his legs. In Jesus' name, grow his legs. And I saw bit by bit, bit by bit, it grew and it lined up. The fella jumped up. He ran around asking friends, are my knees aligned? And he walked away without crutches. I thank God for these times because this was my hidden days. This was the time where I was slaying lions and bears. And I was telling these stories to a pastor friend of of mine in Penang. And he invited me to go and to share a testimony in in his church. It was just a short five-minute testimony. When we went up there and shared the testimony, that five-minute testimony turned into something unexpected. There was a sling season in my life. What was meant to be a short testimony sharing in a service turned to be a full-out healing service where we prayed for people. Don't take my word for this. Pastor Adele was there. Pastor Adele was there. We prayed for people. My wife, Lini, was there. We prayed for people. And after that happened, you know what they did? They changed their Chinese service, their Hokkien service, into a healing service and invited us over as well. And it went to be a full-on healing service. There was a sling season in my life. Why am I sharing this with you? I'm sharing this with you because I want you to know, do not despise the hiddenness. God is calling us into the hiddenness. He is cultivating gifts within us, preparing us so that one day, without us noticing, without us knowing, we will step in into the sling season, into the divine appointment, into the divine open door where He will launch us into our destiny. One of the highlights of me walking in this path is tribal gathering last year. In tribal gathering, I prayed for someone who was half paralyzed because of stroke. And when I prayed, this lady stood up and walked. This lady stood up and walked. Let's give God some praise, really. And this will lead me to my next point and my closing point. It is not me, it is not us, it is God. The stone season. You see, the stone that was thrown to Goliath was just a small stone. Goliath was nine feet something and he got hit down by a stone. And how do I know that it's God? It's God's divine power. Because when a stone hits a person, the person fell, falls backward. But Goliath, the Bible says he fell forward, which is a repetition of what happened in 1 Samuel chapter 5. When the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant into the temple of Dagon, the statue of Dagon fell forward. You see, God, when God is at work, other gods of the world, other principalities of the world will fall and bow at God's authority. So church, we need to be in that hiddenness. I'm calling a generation right now. If you feel that you want to take this on, God, I want to be in that hiddenness. I want to grow into intimacy with you. I want to cultivate the gifts that you've given me. 
I want to go into the hiddenness. Would you rise right now? I'm calling right now. And I'm praying that a generation will rise to this call, to this call of hiddenness. Would you rise right now? Oh yes, Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for a generation that's answering your call to going into the hiddenness, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that those that are here, Lord, they will be the nameless, the faceless, Lord, that will answer your call and cultivate the gifts that you are giving, Lord, that one day you will propel them you will catapult them into the season that they should be in, into the destiny that they should be in, Lord. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, in the hidden seasons that you are, that you're bringing them into, Lord. Lord, would you reveal your face to them, Lord? Would you reveal your face, Lord? Lord, give them the revelation that David got, Lord, that you are his reward, that he is nothing without you. Come what may, calling or no calling, anointing or not, he is. You are His reward. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I'm going to ask the worship team to just sing right now. And I want to call. I want to do one more call. Who here feels that they're going through a season where Goliath is taunting? You're shaken to the core because of the fear and the anxiety. And you need a fresh vision and a fresh revelation of God. God wants to give you that fresh revelation right now. If you are in that season, I want to invite you to the front right now. There will be pastors and there will be ministers here waiting to pray for you. We'll take this time right now. If you are in that season, come up to the front.